Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Justin the Food Entrepreneur's Podcast. I'm Justin Bizarro. I'm your host. That's B-I-Z-Z-A-R-R-O. For anyone who's out there, you can find us on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram at Justin the Food Entrepreneurs. And if you want to find me personally, you can find me at Justin Bizarro. That's B-I-Z-Z-A-R-R-O on Facebook and Instagram. Also, If you're hungry and you don't want to leave your house or your office, you can find a lot of these entrepreneurs on DoorDash. So open up your app and order away. So I'm going to introduce our guest. We're just going to get right to it. I'm I'm charged up today. This, I think, my fourth podcast today. And uh, I'm going to introduce Rafael Ruiz of Emilio's uh, Woodfire Pizza from Nutley, New Jersey. How are you doing today, Rafael? How's it going, Justin? I'm doing good. Yeah, it's been a long day. Uh, we just actually came back from the Ferrara food event down in AC, checked out some new products, and it was a good time. So let's talk about your story a little bit. Like, where? How did you grow up? What did you? What were your influences? And how did you end up a pizza entrepreneur? Oh, all right. So my my, it's funny. Like my family always jokes with me. Like I, I go a thousand miles per hour. Ever since I was little, I've always wanted to do something with work. You know, I was able to do the book stuff, but like when I was 10 years, 12 years old, I would, you know, 10 years old, I would sit outside with a case of water and sell them in the summer to cars, you know, a dollar bottle. And then 12 years old, you know, I wanted a PlayStation and my dad said, give me half the money and you show me half the money, I'll match the half and you can get a PlayStation. So I went out and I shuffled houses and I came home with a ton of money one day. And that was like my parents' first sight into me that, all right, he's going to wind up doing something on his own. You know, he's, he's got it like the drive. And, you know, I recognized that early that in my life that whatever I wanted to do, cause it wasn't really always pizza. I, you know, I've, I was an electrician for a while. I, I just wanted to do it on my own. And the pizza thing kind of fell into my lap because in college I spun pizzas at a little wood fire spot in Verona called Bella Gente. It's no longer there anymore. And, you know, this, this, that job was what really opened my eyes to, wow, I could do labor and it's, you're taking so much pride in giving people something to enjoy. And it was something as small as pizza, you know, and that, that little connection there for me gave me a little foot in the door. Then I had to say to myself, like, you know, after I, I, I did drop out of college and I said to myself, all right, anybody who drops out of college, you got to go to trade school. You know, you got to do a swing a hammer. So I became an electrician. Uh, I finished my trade school and then started working and COVID hit. And it was kind of a bummer because I was still kind of new, kind of not new into the industry. And with COVID hitting, I, we all were out of work for three months. So my father and I were bored out of our minds, stuck in the house and we built a brick oven in my backyard. And it was a way to get everybody from the family together in the backyard, have some, you know, have pizza and enjoy it. Now I'm dating my fiance. Now my girlfriend at the time of when we opened up like the backyard pizzas the first night. Now I thought I knew what I was doing because you know I made pizzas at a restaurant before and my family is very supportive of whatever I do. I will, I'm very blessed with it. So they're telling me, wow, this pizza is so good. It's so good. And she looked at me. She goes, this pizza. Is, and I'm dating this girl maybe like a week or two. She goes, this pizza sucks. I said, wow. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> very tough crowd. And even to this day, I love her dearly. You know, we're getting married soon. And But she's still telling me, like, Ralph, you're having an off day today. And I'm like, that's nice. Thank you. Love you. And she's honestly like, you know, she humbles me because, you know, I got obsessed after that moment. The first time she told me that my pizza wasn't good. I was so determined to make pizza to impress this girl that I didn't know where this relationship was even going. And the cool part was that I actually fell down into a rabbit hole myself and got really into science, like the science of the fermentation process and all different things with different types of yeast, pre-ferments, sourdoughs, natural, you know, everything. But 
in terms of like the business side was I don't, I, I, I hated working for other guys because, you know, in the pizza industry, because you're working really rough hours and, you know, you, you, the creative control wasn't there. Like, you know, I love to do traditional Napoleon style, like toppings. And I also like to put my own twist on certain things. And I, I wanted to be able to show people what I could do. And especially not really coming from a culinary background. It was all, re- I did construction work. So we found the space and built it. I love this. So I'm going to pause you for a second. I want to just anchor a few things. One is let's talk, let's go back a little bit. Let's talk about selling the bottles of water, shoveling the snow, all of those things. Like you're obviously very motivated and, and it's partly about the money, but it's mostly about the independence, correct? Yeah, that's a hundred percent it. And like, just talk to me about like this burning desire inside of you, because you obviously, when you did decided you didn't want to go to school, it's because it wasn't fulfilling you in a way. I think people are like, oh my gosh, you're never going to amount to anything. Just do it. But if you're not fulfilled in it, you're just wasting money and it's never going to work in your favor anyway, because education is caught, not taught. And you can pay a gajillion dollars for your kids to go to school, but if they're not catching what's going on because they don't want to catch it, or there's teachers that aren't teaching in a way that can be caught and living by example, it's very hard for students to actually catch what's being taught in college. That's why it's so easily forgotten because the majority of the professors don't actually live the experience. So it's harder to catch it. And, you know, I'm an overeducated person for sure. But I will tell you that in my experience, the ones who actually had the experience and came back and became professors and had real life experience, you could actually catch what they're teaching. Okay. But the ones who didn't, it's very hard because you're like, I don't relate to what you're saying, especially if you've been entrepreneurial as a kid. Same with you. Same with me. Mowing lawns as a kid. Want my own money. Want my own independence. I don't want to be told what I can buy and not buy. I don't want to be told what I have to do. You know, that's for someone else. Okay. Everyone else has their purpose in life. But my purpose in life was to not to just be independent. Like I can't explain what it was. It wasn't an ego thing. I'm a very, you know, down to earth person and usually pretty genuine and kind. Um, You don't want to mess with me, but it's just the way it is. And the thing about it is, is when we we are this way, it's it's very hard to find fulfillment. And one of the things that I find interesting, how old are you, Raphael? I'm 26. Exactly. And so, like, you've been able to find in your life very early on because you were such an entrepreneurial mind when you were a kid. You started when you were 12, okay? So people are like, oh, my gosh, overnight he just discovered pizza in his backyard. Uh, Here we go. No, we're not. We're talking about stacking skills from being a young age and having that mindset. So I'm going to ask this question. Um, Like, Like, who were your role models growing up? What were your influences? Who did you look up to? You know, I it, it's funny, like, every time I think about, like, who I looked up to, I really always looked up to heavily my parents. You know, my dad came here from Ecuador, and, you know, he was an immigrant and got his citizenship, and he worked tires, tireless, tire, tireless hours to give us food on the table, clothes on our back. He got, you know, he was able to afford a small house for us, you know, at the start. And, you know, now he runs a huge company, you know. Um, And my mom, who went to secretarial school, but took education for herself, which I feel like is the biggest thing. is She constantly studies for her own enjoyment and her own self-worth. And I think that's important is... You can't force education. I think that's a huge problem. You know, forced education is ugly and it really leads to an ugly road. You know, people with $60,000 loans over their head and degrees on, on their walls, but they're not doing anything for themselves or with that degree because they're told they, this is what you should be doing. So my mom, who was able to figure out, you know, she educated herself on her own time. And she's really one of the most brilliant people I know. And my dad's work ethic puts most people to shame. So I, you know, there is no famous person and it's not really a cliche for me, but my parents are really my role models. And 
that's uh, they are partners in my business because I knew that having them with me, there are there are aspects of this world that I'm humble enough to say that I do not know. Like I don't know how to handle a lot of bills. This is my first legitimate business. So, you know, when you're sitting there with piles of paperwork and then you're doing 65, 70 hours a week at your restaurant physically, you need guidance. And sometimes any person will tell you, and I, you know, everybody has that one person in their life that says, you know, Hey, snap out of it, get back on track. And mine is my parents and my fiance. So I, I will say, you know, having an entrepreneurial mind is great. And it's, it's everything that I could have ever wanted, but I do need to be pulled on track. I agree. There's, you know, I think often as entrepreneurs, we don't realize it's, it's like we're in a river and we're, we know we can flow all over the river and drive our boat all over the river, but we need to know what the shorelines are. And sometimes we, we are so visionary and we're so, uh, creative and we're so, visualization driven you know what our goals are and what we want and how we're going to get there we can see the future very well and we can create if we can create a life that gives us that future for sure but the problem is is we don't always understand the boundaries and we don't always understand what where we can go off path because we're so in that that zone for lack of a better term one of the things i like about what you said is well one is the ecuadorian american dream like it, that's important, like that type of work ethic, being able to achieve things and being able to demonstrate that to your children is more important than an education. In my opinion, does the education help solidify things? Sure, it depends on who you are. But the main point of what I'm saying is that your education and your work ethic was your parents leading by example. Okay, and they and therefore you caught it. They didn't like. Well, you got to be a hard worker, Raphael. You're like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna sell water. I'm gonna be my own independent. So you want me half an Xbox or half a uh, PlayStation? I'm gonna go out and shovel uh, snow or whatever. I think that's what you said. Yeah, I had to shovel. I had to shovel snow and whatever because I didn't know how to make money. And my dad, you know, he never would tell us. He never put it in a bad sight because you know when we were young, things were tight. You know, I won't say that we were dead broke, but we were, you know, things were tight, you know, especially when you're coming from a family of trades and, you know, he never told us no, but he always had made sure we had good quality clothes. You know, he always said, you have to have good shoes, good clothes and good food He goes, everything else will fall into place. And we really, he didn't make a lot of money back in the day, but I said, like, I really want a PlayStation. Like, you know, my buddy's got them. And he said, I'll tell you that and he, I don't think he said it in the begin in that moment because he wanted to teach me a lesson, but it was also like, Hey, I know you, you got it in you. You've seen you do it with waters. Now go shovel those houses. Let me see you do that. Get some money. And he thought I was going to stop after the block and make like, you know, a hundred dollars. I wound up coming home with a couple hundred. So it, uh- it shocked them. And I'm the same way. If you're going to give me a goal, I'm going to overachieve it. I don't know why or financially or whatever. And it drives people crazy. And as you get older and you have more success in your life doing this, it's amazing how friends and sometimes family members, the jealousy and envy, but they don't realize you've been stacking this skill your whole life. Like the minute you always do more or go the extra mile or go an extra 10 miles, you are starting to make distance on your previous self and unknowingly you're making distance on everyone else. And that's, you know, one of the things when I was like hunting Raphael down to be on the podcast, (laughs) because that's what I do. I'm very persistent. And I'm like, "Uh, there's something special about you. Do you really want, I think you should really do this. And I don't always push everyone the way I pushed Raphael, but I could tell by the way he answered me, by the way he was communicating with me, that this is a hustler who's, been born this way there was a seed inside of him that he then grew you grew it you know your parents helped fertilize it for sure and made sure you had an environment that was safe to grow in but you did the growing okay i just want to emphasize that but one of the things i love about your story is that you don't have there's not a negative aspect to it Okay, there's a lot of people that can get caught in. Well, if I do this, well, this might happen and I need to be safe. And it's very fear driven. You've been able to to use your parents as role models and seen their experience and use it as a way to give you confidence. 
even though you admit it and have humility, which is, I don't always know. And I will tell you in my twenties and like, <laughs> I was like, I look back on it and people judge me for it still. And I'm like, I was 20 years old, 25 years old. I was learning this stuff as I was doing it. There was no education teaching me what was going on in the world because entrepreneurism is right now. We're the tip of the spear cutting the flesh. There's, you can't go back and re, you can't read a case study on what's going on in the world right now. I know everyone's like, oh, education, let's go look at Southwest Airlines or whatever the new airline or whatever the new case studies are about, whatever companies, but they're in the past. They're in the rearview mirror. And if you focus on them and you focus on them too much, I will tell you it's great if you want to be a manager and just like have knowledge and and not trust your gut but if you're an entrepreneur you're at the tip of the spear like you can have a foundational education or you can have a foundational experience but at the end of the day it's you versus you because every decision you make makes or breaks what you do next and that's a lot of pressure for some people but on the other hand if you grew up doing it and get in the habit of okay i fail here i fail there i fail there but i know that failure is actually growth it's learning and it's another growing opportunity every time and it's not actually a failure you have to go through this the more times you go through it the better you become you know and it's yeah, like yeah i definitely i definitely agree with that i mean i i will say this as someone like the position i grew up in is i will my my parents my i was forced to go to college you know my mom and dad really pushed and to the point where you know i was in a first generation college accepted program for anatomy and physiology and physics going into my senior year of high school. And I got some college credits when I graduated that program. And, you know, college was really kind of the spe- the goal for my parents, for me. And, you know, I, I, there was a moment in my time where I said, you know what, maybe I do want to go to college, but then I went. And I think if I didn't give it the shot, I would have regretted not going because People like me, and I guarantee people like you that just, ha- they have to get the proof for themselves because it doesn't matter what anybody says until I see it. Like I need to, why doesn't my dough work one day? Let's say it's too hot. It overproofs. If I don't physically touch it, I can't make it a, a, a correction in that, you know, I, and that's huge, you know? So I'm grateful for the fact I went to college and I did blow money because I didn't graduate, but what it did reassure though, is I never had that little voice inside my head saying, you know, what if I did go to college? Cause I did it and I knew that it wasn't right for me. So for me, the entrepreneurial thing was, it was just solidified. I think after I stopped going to college, you know, I agree with you. And I think that part of what happens um, in this case is that, there's a freeing that had to go on. And then while you went to trade school and you could have gone in a different direction, weirdly, there was a freeing. You guys did the right thing. You're trying to build a brick oven outside. You're trying to bring your family together. And it, unintentionally, you find this passion, which you had known pizza, but there's a challenge, okay? And when we're challenged as entrepreneurs, like there's a special thing that goes on and we have to almost prove ourselves, okay? You th- say, I can't do it. You say it's bad. I'm going to prove you wrong in the future. Not necessarily right now, but in the future. And then it becomes a weird challenge where it's not angry. It's not aggressive. But it's like, I have to do this because now I can't live. It's been implanted in me. I can't live until I get it right. And sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it takes months. Sometimes it takes weeks. It depends on what it is. But it's such a growing experience, and we don't realize how important of a skill that is to have those burning desires, to have that burning yeah. desire like, can I do more? Can I do better? Am Were I doing you an enough? Athlete? Yes, I was an athlete. So was I. What did you play? I played soccer. Yeah, I played soccer, wrestling, and I trained jiu-jitsu competitively. Yeah, there you go. And now I CrossFit quite a bit and it, that's a big deal and i and doesn't I have, it drive you nuts when you can't hit prs yes exactly <laughs> exactly that's exactly what it is and um and i like the competition not necessarily against the other people but particularly against myself and it's always been that way like soccer it's a team sport you want the team to do well but i was very hard on myself and always wanting to improve myself in my own skill and make sure that i could contribute 
as much as I could possibly do. I was never really focused on what the other team members were doing, and I got on better and better teams by focusing on that, really. I just constantly improved my skills, and I grew up on a farm, so there was a lot of time alone and kicking the soccer ball against horse stalls and, and then flipping around and doing tricks and then going to the other side, which had a horse stall. Um, I'll have to take a picture of something and show it to everyone on, on Instagram at some point, but one of the things is there's a constant that constant desire of improvement and whether it's mentally or physically it's always there um and i think that it's people are like oh isn't that miserable well there's a weird satisfaction and happiness and joy in the pursuit of it and i think that that's what we're talking about here so let's talk about how do you come up with the name for your business how do you find a location for your business? How how do you how were you brave enough to even take on this step of having a business? So, the name originated the same day. I think it was the second backyard pizza thing with my family and my she was my girlfriend at the time. Her name's Julia. It was the second party we had, and where you know I'm cooking pizzas and I'm making them you know a little bit better. And my sister comes up to me at my, no, Julia comes up to me and says, you know, is this, you know, something you love to do? I said, one day when I'm retired, you know, maybe I'll do it, you know, open up a, cause I was an electrician, you know, and I was taught at that moment though, in that point in my life, it was like, okay, do the nine to five, go home, retire, and then do something like, you know, then enjoy your life. You know, that was the mentality for a little bit of my life. And then when I got the, into the pizza stuff again, it kind of like jolted me, you know, we're just having people over and serving them. And she looked at me, she goes, what would you name it? And I said, I don't know. She goes, I like Emilio's. And I'm like, that has a nice ring to it. So later that night, my sister comes up to me and says the same thing. Goes, you should open up a pizzeria one day and call it Emilio's. I was like, that's weird. Did you talk to Julia? She's like, no, why? I'm like, she said the exact same thing about an hour or two ago. And, you know, who said it first is still going on between them. Julia said it first. <laughs> but it started off like, you know, the name came from there. And it's nice because I get to pay homage to one of like, you know, a very key person in my family, which was my great grandfather. He's a tough dude, you know, worked like an animal and, you know, it was well-respected in the family and community. And it was nice to pay homage to And I just want to point out, as it is your middle name, so your name is actually Rafael Emilio Ruiz, correct? Yeah. yeah. And so I, Rafael Emilio Ruiz. And, and Ruiz, sorry. And, um, and I want to emphasize this, because I'm Justin Ryan Bizarro. That's why I launched a new show for non-food entrepreneurs who are all wanting to come on here. Um, but I'm like, no, this is for the food entrepreneurs. It's called the Justin Ryan Bizarro Show. But as we did it, I got very good advice because it was originally like, oh, the Johnny Carson Show, oh, the Justin Bizarro Show. But they're like, you're a whole human. Use your whole name. And what you've done unintentionally and what they instilled in you is given you the ability to use your whole name and let you be the whole human you were meant to be, you know, symbolically into your business. And it's so significant. And I wouldn't have noticed it unless it's happened to me over and over again when I actually embrace who I am holistically. What is my real name that was given to me? And what is my purpose in that? And it's so crazy cool um, that almost God spoke through two people at the same time for you. And and that in my interpretation, this is a reinforcement and like, okay, like we're only two days into this thing. They've already helped me come up with a name. They must really believe in me, but it's also making you the whole person. And it also symbolizes your legacy. You know, the American dream, your grandfather, your father, your mother, what you've been able to do here. So it's honoring your legacy also, which I think is really a big deal when it comes to who you are. Because I yeah, see I it mean, already. I yeah, my name is what I always put my middle name when I I just like the sound of it, you know, and I never knew up until recently. I had never really dove into my family's history and my roots. And ever until recently, I would say about the last three years, I really got involved with it, especially with the name Emilio's. And, you know, yeah, it's definitely a 
way to, you know, having your name, you are my now I'm my whole person, which is a really beautiful thing. But it's also the fact there was a Ralph's Pizza in, in the town I was opening. <laughs> and I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> Well, and Emilio sounds more like pizza. It's got a nice ring to it, right? <laughs> yeah. And so let's talk about Emilio's wood fire pizza. Let's. How'd you find location? Why, why'd you choose the town you did? There's obviously other pizza places there. We just talked about Ralph's. And oh yeah. So, about nine. so talk to me about like you're going into this. You're obviously not caring about the competition. But how did you decide? the building you were in how'd you start looking for it how'd you make this decision to go from a brick oven pizza in the backyard to an actual business all right so it started off in the backyard and i would say about a year and a half to two years in i've experimented with over 300 different doughs at that point 340 exactly messed around with 340 different types of dough meaning different flours percentages, hydration, all that stuff. And I finally had one that clicked one day. And I was like, this is good pizza. So my family was so sick of eating pizza that I said, you know what? I'm going to make like a silly little Instagram page and say, Emilio's wood fire pizza, $10 pies, pick them up at the house. Because I just wanted to make the pizza. I was, you know, it was a passion of mine. And it was a goal to get better at it for, honestly, this girl that I met. And I would say I put up a post with all my friends and I said, hey, guys, doing a pizza pop up night. And first night I had my my little sister taking the money. My mom was helping me like top and passing out wine to people. And people were coming in the backyard and buying ten dollar pies. We didn't sell a lot. Then after that we were getting messages like hey you doing it again you ordering pizza again you doing it i was like oh i guess the pizza's pretty good so i did it again and there were more people this time it was getting every week i just started doing it making 80 pies people would dm me like hey i'll pick it up at five o'clock six pies five pies and they would come in through the front door pick up the pies and then you know go home All of a sudden, uh, I remember NJ Food Travel. She's a foodie blogger. She's like one of the foodie girls. And she messaged me saying like, hey, cool pizzas. I was like, come grab one, you know, come grab a pie. And she's a food blogger. So I was like, you know, it would be cool to see like what they think. I had no idea about this industry. I didn't know what they, they did. I just knew that this girl posts food. So she came, picked up pies, and put up a post about us. We started to generate traction on Instagram that way. And all of a sudden, every week, we started getting more and more customers until the town of Bloomfield heard about it, and they shut us down. So they shut us down really quick, and we had to stop selling pizzas out of the house. So we bought a mobile oven, and we did private catering events so i have this big oven on a trailer that i take to house parties and fairs and i would sell pizzas out of this and and legitimately do it that was like when the business became i registered the business as emilio's woodfire llc and we had it going so it started it really took bloomfield to smack us on the wrist to do this legitimately I love this. I'm going to let you continue. But one of the things I want to anchor here is when you know you're succeeding, watch someone try to knock you down. Okay, even if it's the right kind of knocking down, when you get knocked down or someone comes in like, I will call it the tall poppy, chops down your poppy to make you the level of everyone else or make things fair, you know you're on to something. Okay, you're you have customers you're getting recognition obviously people heard about it's like okay knock you down okay now you use on the entrepreneurial ingenuity that you've developed your whole life and you're like i'm gonna figure out how to do this better and that's the trailer i mean i couldn't think of a better way or a better example to drive this point or anchor it with the audience than that um so that being said what happens from here so you're like now you're like okay i'm going to do the trailer how are you doing the prep work how are you getting all the ingredients how do you even 
from not coming with the food industry, how do you adjust to your new life as now with a, a food trailer, basically, a pizza trailer? So um, I still uh, wood got, and I oven did, on wheels. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I work construction. I work landscaping. I did everything, snow removal. So I know how to tow a trailer. I know how to, you know, I, I knew how to physically set up. I was fine. You know, I'm, I'm a workhorse. So the amount of work in terms of prep, you know, and learning this industry was this is where like the obsession kicked in and just me being like, you know, what makes sense? You know, I called a ton of pizzerias saying, can I ask about your margins? Can I ask about your markups? What is typical? What's not? And I got shut down by everybody. And so I started messaging them yeah. personally oh, yeah. on it. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was uh, brutal. I've been, there. Like, I've been there. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, it, it's crazy. People come into my restaurant and I'm such an open book with things. I say, here's my dough recipe. Go for it. You want to try it? Be my guest. Let me know what you think. Cause the, the only way you're going to grow is by honestly sharing. People right, are so close. Oh yeah. People are closed up. And what are you going to learn? Like everybody talks about network, network, network. And then when it push comes to shove, you can't, you're too scared to even tell them about like what you do. Cause you think they're going to take your competition. 80%. Most of my business is because they come for us because they like the atmosphere we set. And you know, we don't kill people on prices. You know, I, I make enough where I can give somebody a $13 margarita because when you break down the numbers, you're still making a good profit. So I really dove into weighing out every how much cheese goes on a pie? How much is it cost per pound? And I broke everything down to grams. So a bag of flour, I, I, you know, it's, I I bought the big bag, you know, weighed out everything. I got 180 dough balls at 250 grams each, you know? So at one bag of flour, you know, you get, it's it's 50 bucks because I wasn't a rep. I wasn't a company at the time, you know, couldn't buy volume. So for $50 for the bag of Caputo Blue through, I get 180 dough balls, it's really not a lot of money. So what am I paying for? Gas, wood, and the toppings weren't a lot either. I just had to make sure I hit my numbers. And so I just dove into the obsessive uh, attitude again. And if you're not obsessed about what you do, you're going to make mistakes. You know, so like I don't want to cut myself short, but I also didn't want to rip people off. That's why I went into the mobile game. And I knew that me selling the pies at a set price because everybody charges for the mobile parties per head. Right. Well, if you charge per head and, you know, let's say we ring them up for 25 people, but 10 people show up to the party, then you got an issue where this guy feels like they lost money. Right. So that's why I sell my pizzas per pie. Like if you order 25 pies from my mobile company, we charge you 700 bucks. We bring the whole oven. We cook for you for a couple of hours. Then we pack up and go. You don't even have to clean. So for $700, there's no stress of mind. And then anything left over, we box up and give to you guys. So that's how I work because I think that there's value in that. And nobody's getting screwed at the end of the day. That's how I've always viewed my business. And so far, God bless, it's been working. I love this. Um, let's. So, I mean, are you mainly out of the trailer now? Only are, are you going into a brick and mortar? Like, what? It, where do you hope this goes? If it, you're not already in one, I have a store. I've had it for seven months. There you go. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So after the mobile, you know, the mobile oven was you know, getting out of control. I was booking about three to four events a week and it's a lot of money. And a lot of it was, you know, it was a lot of money. And my fiance and I had to make a decision where we sat many nights and talked like what's it's, it's risky, but do we have a house yet together? No, but you know, we don't have kids yet either. You know, this is the, and she kept saying to me, this is what you really love to do. You know, put your head down and, you know, basically do it. Don't be scared. And I was anybody who is not terrified out of their mind to take the risk is out of their mind. They they either don't know how intense a business is or you're you're crazy. Like I was terrified. 
but I had support and I, I knew that I knew what I was doing for the most part. That is what makes you do it. If you, if you don't have the mentality of you, sh- you, you should be scared. But she looked at me and she goes, you got this. You got this. And we made it work because that's what you got to do. Once you sign that lease, you got to do it. So originally what happened was, you know, let me just take it back real quick before we got into like that whole idea, like the mentality of it. But we talked many nights and the oven was taken off. The mobile oven was getting crazy. I couldn't keep up with my full time job running job sites and doing this so she uh we talked a couple couple times and we went to go look for places so we found an established brick and mortar store a couple towns over the guy was kind of retiring and we made an offer and he took it it was ready to go had a little clientele and everything but everything was rubbing me the wrong way about this place like the landlords weren't really you know, I didn't really feel the landlords too much. And his following was a little bit strange. Like they really loved what he did and, you know, God bless him, but it's nothing crazy. You know, you gotta be, he thought he had gold and I hate to break it to you. You didn't. So, yeah. you know, if you're, if you think you're the, if you think you're the best at that point, quit because end on your high note. Because there's going to be somebody that comes in better. And I really knew that I was going to make mistakes in the beginning. So we actually wound up pulling out of the deal because it was just too many issues. Yeah, and probably it, it, dodged it, a bullet. Oh, yeah. and But we dodged a bullet. But mentally, you know, I already put my time in at my job. Because I don't, you know, I put my time in at my job. You know, we were ready to go with this place. And I pulled out because I just wasn't comfortable with the situation. So it really does take a toll on you mentally when you're saying to yourself, like, this is it, this is it, this is it. And everything falls through. So I said, you know what? Time to step back and reevaluate this whole idea. Well, so and day, I want to yeah, and one, I want to anchor something. One of the things that happens there is um, is that when we do this and we actually are like, this doesn't feel right because our gut's telling us there's a huge sense of relief. That's unbelievable. When we get out of a situation like that, even though it's scary because we put so much time into it and effort and we lose all of that time and effort and whatever, there is a weird relief that actually happens when you know you made the right decision. I can already hear it in your voice. You knew once you made it, that you would be better off by going a different direction. So anyway, go ahead. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, like, how do you compete? You know, it's almost like, you know, it's like going into New York with my sign saying New Jersey best slice. Like, you don't do that. You know, it's just not a good look. Exactly. So I said to myself, I was like, you know, it it hurt. And everybody saw that because I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Everybody knows that. I'm very, you could read me like a book, but I'll never lie. I'll tell you what's up. And I was really torn about that because I thought it was good to go. So, you know, a couple of weeks come down the road. I'm still just pumping out the mobile events. And it's like the dead, you know, it's cold, you know. So it's a lot. It takes a lot out of you, you know, doing these mobile events in 40 degrees, 50 degrees because you had quit your job like an idiot too soon. So planning wise, yeah, maybe I rushed it. But thank gosh, I went out to lunch with my mom one day because she knew I was a little off. And we're on Chestnut Street in Nully. We went to Chestnut Street Cafe. And we're walking back to the car, and I see this for for rent, you know, by owner. And I was like, okay, let's call him. It's a 750-square-foot restaurant. And well, it's a 750-square-foot space. It was an old thrift store. And... I called the landlord and the landlord was wonderful. She was open to our idea of what we wanted to do. I called my fiance. We FaceTimed her, showed her the space, came back with her, with the realtor. And it just felt like it could work. Now, is it the most ideal place? God, no. It's very tiny. But we make it cozy and we make it fun and we make it fast paced and the food has to be good. So with that being said, you know, we signed the lease got 
all then had to learn how to really do the paperwork for a business. And people don't realize there is a ton of paperwork before you can even walk into a retail space to do construction. And I had no idea. I just was used to doing the construction. So I after love this. all, of, yeah, after about two months of getting the paperwork together, insurance, properly doing the LLC, doing, you know, getting my permits together with my old company. Shout out to AF Electric and AF Contracting for Vanguard Contracting for doing the permits. And they did a lot of the work for me. It was wonderful. But I was a contractor, so I did majority of it. So we get we went in there and we got that place, me and my buddies, framed, roughed everything to pass pre-inspection with in the first three weeks of signing the, you know, getting, getting our insurance, you know, then we finished that whole job in three months and it came out sick. The oven guys, you know, the, the oven we have in the restaurant, you know, Mata Forney, they are, you know, top of the top of the game right now. They make traditional Neapolitan wood fire ovens. They're out in Maryland and they have, they invited us to the factory to come try the ovens. We went to their test kitchen. I tried out all the different ovens and they made it so easy for me. You know, my fiance and I, you know, even got a tour on how they built the ovens and the way they built it was the way I built the one in my backyard. So it was like a no brainer to pick that oven. So even just coordinating everything so that this whole job was completed in three months, it somehow worked. We pulled it together. And we opened the doors September 8th. And the day before I opened the door, we had a carbon monoxide leak because the plumber did a, did the job wrong to replace the water heater, the water tank. Oh, geez. So 3 o'clock in the morning the night before, I'm still trying to prep for our opening night because I'm nervous, you know? I can't sleep. So 3 o'clock in the morning, I am call my fiance crying. And she's like, are you drunk? And I said, no, the smoke alarm won't go off. And she's like, Ralph, that's your carbon monoxide alarm. Get out of there. So the mentally yeah. just so screwing I, you over, man. Like, no. Yeah, and that- I like, it, I crawled out of the basement. I was so weak. And the fire department came. I mean, I got picked up and I, I was starting to get carbon monoxide poison. It was really bad. Yeah, it's serious business. Yeah. So. To make sure that I could still open for our soft opening, we brought tea kettles to use for hot water to clean properly. So my whole kitchen was filled with friggin' tea kettles just so we can get our, like, you know, work out the kinks before our real opening. Because I needed to do it. I had the dough ready. I had money invested into, like, the food. I had to do something that night, the next day. So we did it. And it was surprisingly smooth then the following week everything was fixed with the hot water heater you know final inspections were 100 percent redone and completed again and we opened up for our grand opening night and we were we didn't know the staff that we needed right because this is a this is new to us my fiance is here my mom my sisters my dad my and then our one employee at the time Nobody knew what it was going to take. Right now, we have five employees. No, we have eight employees, you know, waitresses and kitchen staff, because that's what it takes to run this operation. And we didn't know. So we were doing it with two employees and family. It was nuts. And it was a lot of fun. But every day we were there till I was there till like one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, learning this business. I put my bones in I love this. So talk to me. How did you develop your menu? Like, I mean, how do you come up with ingredients? Like, how did you choose the right dough? Like, as you're going into this restaurant, you're now dealing with another oven. Do you still have the trailer, I guess, is one of the questions. Do you still use that for events? But the main question is, is how do you come up with a menu? How do you choose what your pizzas are? Um, and, and sort of let's talk to the audience what your most popular items are. Yeah, so I don't. When when we when when I designed my menu, 
I knew the, what I wanted in the restaurant, meaning I knew what style of service I wanted. I knew what the level, the standard of pizza I wanted, which I put my pizza to a very high standard. And we get compared to all of the big guys, like all the big names all the time. And that was really all I had in mind. Like I knew I do pizza margarita, pizza marinara, and, you know, Really, the only other one I designed was the Bianco y Verde, which is our pesto and ricotta cheese pie. But my sister, Olivia, who designed one of our most popular pies, which was the Olivia, she really puts together majority of our menu because she's got an incredible palate. She's a brilliant girl. She's got an incredible palate. And she understands seasonality. She understands flavor profiling which is something that I'm learning to do. I get, I grew up where, you know, I know what I like. I like my ziti on my Sundays. I like sauce on Sundays. I, you know, I, 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 that's what I like. If I could die tomorrow, my last meal would be pasta vazo, you know, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Me too. I, I, I never put, I never thought about putting mascarpone on a piece of pizza. So my <laughs> yeah. sister, who she pushed the boundaries. Yeah. I love this for me. And now I'm going back and forth with her. And I'm not even going to lie. Sometimes I get stumped by her. I'm like, how the hell did you? We do a pie with peaches, mascarpone cheese, prosciutto, balsamic glaze. And, you know, we grilled the way she, she even said it. Like, we did it before. We did it the first time. And she's like, no, Ralph, you've got to grill the peaches because it gives you this. You know, her, her mind is in, incredible. And yeah, the caramelization on the pizzas, uh, I mean on the peaches for the pizza, is pretty awesome. I like that. Yeah. This sounds delicious, actually. She's uh, she's really brilliant. And I, I, I pay ma- everybody who asks me in the restaurant, you could, ask, you know, if you ever come in, dine, you'll meet, you'll see my sister there. She's the Friday night waitress because, you know, and she'll tell you. He he designs the pizzas, but that's not the truth. She knows that's good for business, but that's not the truth. My sister designed. I go right to the table after I hear it. I'm like, yeah, no, I didn't make any of these. I made the dough because that's my ADHD. I had to make sure this dough was perfect and consistent, and even just down to texture things. You know, you gotta be obsessed in, in this industry. You know, my fiance's in hair, right? She does hair and makeup for bridal and weddings. And she does highlights. And the way that she looks at pizza is the way I look at hair, where we can't, we know when something's good, but we can't explain it to each other. But I could explain what's wrong with the pizza and she, she could explain hair. So having her to like say to me, that's wrong. I can't tell you why it's wrong. Just reassures my mind. And that's how we play this game with each other back and forth. And she's a perfectionist, too. So it really puts me at a competition with her. Like, we both want to be the top of our industries. Yeah, I'm, uh, I get that as well. And I very much, in it, like, that matters to me in a relationship as well. That drive, that almost competitive nature, for sure. As long as it can be, sometimes be a little competitive with one another in those relationships. But the uh, to an extent... But I think when you're actually competing with each other to push each other harder to saying that we can do better, I want to be the best in my industry, I want you to be the best in yours, here's feedback so we both can win. And I'm willing to receive feedback also when it's a mutual thing, when it goes back and forth. I think it's also – so talk to me a little bit about this because you guys – have a good relationship. You obviously communicate and talk about things a lot. I don't think everyone does that. In your relationship, like, what do you think the top things, like, I'm going to ask you this because you mentioned your sister, your mom, your dad, and your fiance. Give me a little bit, like, the three things, the core values in them that you that you admire in them or that you look to them for, um, if you can name them. Because I think it's important I'm going to anchor because teamwork is is really important to the entrepreneur. While the entrepreneur can put things together, and I'll use Steve Jobs as an example, he had the idea of the i Apple phone, but he didn't he didn't know how to get there, so he had to take stepping stones like an iPod, you know, an iPad touch or iPod touch, iPads. Oh yeah. And computers, they were all stepping stones. And actually while he had the idea, he had a really group of creatives, really smart people around him that helped him create that dream. So 
tell me about each one your your mom your dad your sister your fiance what are sort of the the core values or qualities that you admire in them yeah i will say you know out of the every every person in my family and i'm going to break it down by person a little bit because i can't salt lump sum the core values yeah i love because this if I, it, it's very difficult with this kind of situation because mm, let's start with my dad my dad is his, he's always wanted to own a business but he you know he he does he did what he felt is right you know to supply us of, of give us a, a life of stability and which it is what pushes me to a little more is you know, I want to be able that when he retires, he can come hang out and say that he owns this, you know, a successful business because he has a partner in this. Me and my mom and my dad are all partners and he does a lot of the maintenance for us, too, because when I'm busy with construction, like we had a, 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 a problem with our plumbing one day. We couldn't call a plumber at 10 o'clock at night, you know, eight o'clock at night during dinner service. So my dad comes and repairs the, the clock, you know, he, he's always there in terms of when the restaurant, the chairs hit the wall too much. He comes in on his day off and paints. He splits wood in the back. He's very behind the scenes, nothing with food, but he'll wash dishes when I'm, when I'm down. Like he helps me out. He's basically like, you know, he's a support. He supports me just like any good father would. Now, my sister, she's waited table since she was 14. She's done fine dining. She's done casual pizzeria. Olivia knows customer service. She's also not scared. She's not a, a pushover. Both my sisters, Hannah and Olivia. So they were, they are the face of Emilio's in the sense of when you come to dine, you're going to get Olivia's or Hannah's personality in your face and you're going to, it, it's a nice experience. You know, they're, they care about you. They're attentive. They're not forgetful. And they are really creative, both of them. They're, they're highly creative women. And, you know, that's, the, I think what Olivia brings to the table is a sense of, you know, she just rounds out the place. You know what I mean? That's the best way to put it. She rounds out the place. Because me and my mom are always there. My mom is my equal in this. Me and my mom put in time and effort. She shows me how to do the books. I sit with her. We do it together. She's the one that can also rein me and be like, Ralph, why are you spending that much this week? Explain it. What special are we doing? You know, should we cut labor costs? Because my mind's going as I want to do a white. I want to do a black truffle pie on top of oyster mushroom. You know, I want to do something crazy. And she's like, Ralph, you know, that may not be right this week. Why don't you give it two weeks and then let's do it. So she's really pulling the, the reins back, which is what is needed. You know, you need that in a person to have a, that sounding board, the person of reason. The person who could see it from a di an outside point of view, because in my head, you know, I want to be able to give people the most incredible pizza in the world. And what that requires is some weeks buying three different bite bags of flour and testing them. But if you don't have that sounding board to say to you, like, hey, Ralph, remember, we're seven months in a business. You know, money isn't disposable right now. Yeah. But There's no are, money tree in the backyard and then it exactly. isn't growing out of the pizza oven. Exactly. And, you know, I will say, God bless, we're doing OK. You know, we're doing quite well for a brand new business. But it's also from the fact that my mom is able to rein it in. And she spent years with my dad. You know, we were tight on money growing up. And she was able to make sure that the bills were paid. The credit stayed high. You know, the credit scores were up. You know, we never we were educated. We, we always were involved in sports. And she always said, you know, when we grew up, it was like, we always wanted to go out to eat. We never went out to eat. My mom cooked. And it, she never would tell us it's because we can't afford it. She would always say, why would you go eat there when I can make it? You know? Yeah. And and that was our mentality. It's like, oh, why? Yeah. Why would I go out and spend my money eating when my mom can make it? 
So it was a good way to buffer it. And I think she does that now today, you know, even till this day. Because if you don't have that person just to, just like you said with Steve Jobs, you know, he had people that said, you know, right now it's not possible, but in the future it is. And and that's what she says to me is like, you know, right now we can't do this. You know, we're staffing. We don't have the staff right now. Or, you know, the money's not there right now. Or the money is there. Do it now. Do it now while you can. You know, she's my voice of reason. And I got to say the last part, you know, a core value is my fiance. It's when people say it's alone, you're alone at the top. It, it's it's true, but not in the sense that people think. Like you're alone because you feel like you're alone. Sometimes you're ne- you're never really alone. I mean, in my case, I'm never really alone. But when you're putting in 60 to 65 hours a week and you don't have time to go really on dates and you know you're stressed because you had a slow Tuesday a slow Wednesday night you know and you're able to come back to that voice of I love you it's going to be okay you know that's the kind of stuff that keeps you going and at night and in the morning you know helps a 16 18 hour day go by you know, there was a couple of days where I pulled all nighters and she just dropped me off coffee and says, I love you. You're doing great. And, you know, you are alone at those moments at two, three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes when you're trying to prep bacon because you got a hundred pie mobile event and then a 300 pie dinner service, you know, you need that rock and she is my rock. So everybody in my family in this restaurant has a purpose. I don't know what they are a hundred percent, but I know that that's kind of where they're at. Well, it's like any good team when they're in a flow, you don't necessarily know what the other person's doing. There's just this weird moment where you all start to flow. It's almost like you get it. And it's the difference between you could have a team full of great athletes and you could have a team full of good athletes. But if there's a leader and a vision and the team can play well together, they can beat the greatest athletes, even if the team was an all-star team, a team that plays well together, that understands each other, that covers for each other, that plays their positions well, often will out will beat a team, even the greatest teams in the world. It's why you know the Lakers probably have the biggest budget in the world right now, but they're not going to win every game. you know. And so that's because... That went skill and that what I'll call a common flow state on a team where you're in that flow that is so beautiful to watch. And if you play soccer, you'll see it every once in a while. They'll start stringing together passes like 30, 40 in a row, and they're creating, they're spreading out the field. And then all of a sudden it's like boom, boom, boom. They score a goal, and everyone's like, oh, that happened so fast. But you didn't see them build up that momentum. Uh, build up that familiarity with each other, start to get into their groove and play their positions where they can then execute because slowly that groove dismantles the other team. Same in basketball. That's why you run plays. You Running plays gets you into the flow. So I really like this. So, Rafael, we're like you're obviously doing the mobile uh, catering still. You have a brick and mortar. Like where are you hoping this goes? What are your dreams? Oh, how do you man. vision this? Where do you want it to go? It doesn't matter how big it is. Let's talk about it and let's get it said out loud into the universe so we can start manifesting this motherfucker. Right? <laughs> Ideally, I want to be, I want to take Emilio's to the point where, you know, I, how do I put it? I, I really want to be in a more heavily foot traffic town. In addition to Emilio's, Emilio's too, like the number, the n- number two store is definitely going to be coming within five years. We're pretty confident in it. Um, I care more about starting a family right now as well. Like I really do want to get my life with my fiance rolling as well. So, if, but definitely number two would be the store. But my fiance does come first in my life. And so does my family's amount of time, you know, that they put in. Because until everybody's cross-trained in the restaurant, meaning my staff, my family does fill in a lot of the gaps. So, like, my mom answers the phone. My sisters wait tables. You know, I hate 
they're it, I res- I love them for that. And, you know, we're doing this together because they want to do this with me. But you also have to be able to, if they wanted to not come in one day just because they don't want to or they need a day, I want my place to still be able to run smooth. So I always look at this as like a day by day operation. It's like, how am I going to make today the best dough today? Because if I make the best pizza out there today, I know I'm going to get customers in the door. You can't tell me that I'm not going to get customers if my pizza is the best pizza around. Pizza is a universal food. People like pizza. So if you're going around to Joe Schmo and you you can come to my restaurant, you're going to pay a couple extra dollars or you're going to save some money by coming to my restaurant. I, I put the hours in every day to make the best pizza. But in terms of three years, let's talk about three years. I really want this place to run on its own. I want to be able to go in, handle front of the house, just make expediting, do food expediting for the pizza department. Develop a more creative menu, get into the get the mobile oven going a little heavier, you know, take on more big events. Um, that's that's really the, the three year plan. The five year plan is for the second location and to hopefully be married at the, with a kid by then. And, you know, my 10 year plan is I, I. I can't even tell you my 10 year plan because I'm, I'm happy with where I'm at. I, I think that I'm creating a life with my fiance for my family that's happy. And I think that's more valuable than any, you know, nominal number is I, to be happy. I, I, I sold cars when I was 19. I made $120,000 in my first year and I was miserable. I agree with you 100% on, on that type of stuff. Like there's, I've been flooded with money and miserable, like way more than I could have ever imagined. I mean, probably made more in a year than most people make in a lifetime. And sometimes you're just like, you have this thing. If you're not fulfilling your purpose, you're not having the independence, you're not creating your own freedom and it's not your dreams. There's this weird misery that comes around. I would call it suffering. Actually, it's a suffering and it's it's almost like a comparison unintentionally because it's while you have all these things, you're still comparing yourself, your own self to who you think you are and want to be versus who you are in that moment. And money doesn't fix it, you know, no matter no, what. No, it doesn't. And, no, it doesn't. And if you're in the wrong situation, the wrong environment, it's definitely not fixing your, your thing. And you can't – the other part that really happens to, to your point – is you can't grow in environments you're not happy in. And if it's not a suitable environment, the flower dies, the plant dies eventually. It eventually if you're not growing, there is no stagnation. That's that's no, there is no plateau in life. It's either you're growing or you're not. And if you're not, you're dying. Okay? And that's like and that's in our souls, that's in our bodies, that's who we are, especially as entrepreneurs. If we're not building, we're not growing, we're not scaling, we're not doing we don't have purpose you know whether it's family or living our dreams or making sure we fulfill the seed of entrepreneurism that's been instilled in us by god um in my case that's who i look to that's my higher power then i don't feel purpose i feel lost and i can go miserable and suffering really quickly okay and you know i've gotten better at that but the truth is i know when i'm going down the right path or i know if i'm going down a business or a partnership or whatever that doesn't feel good because this unfulfillment starts coming in and i get it there you you want to be sort of unfulfilled because you want the desire to keep going and be better but what i'm talking about is this unfulfillment that's like negative on your personality that leads to negativity that leads to this weird unhappiness that's not necessary there's uncomfortability oh, and there's unhappiness yeah. you know you wake up in the middle of the night and you're just angry and you don't know why you exactly can't sleep. you know and i was making a ton of money I, I had a nice car i had you know i did what i wanted because nobody cared when you had money when you're young and i say like i was I was just not, I wasn't Ralphie anymore. You know, I wasn't Emilio, you know, I wasn't who I was always my whole life. I was always angry and I was frustrated and mental health issues came with it. And, you know, when I had to get them all taken care of, you know, I stepped back and I realized, you know, I'm going to start doing the things for the, I'm going to work for the right reasons, you know, and that's what it was for me. And then I, then it came back of, 
I was working to make money. Then I was working to enjoy my job. Now I'm working to build a build an empire in this game because I'm telling you, my goal isn't to stop here. My goal is to make the best pizza in the game. And I don't care. People are going to tell me I'm crazy, but every day I change my dough. Every day I, I take measurements on the, the dough's final temperature when I come in in the morning. I, I'm a lunatic because I know that if I can make what's the best pizza in the world or the best pizza I can make, I will be okay, and I will pro- I'll prosper. I love this. I'm definitely going to have you back on the show for a part two because we have a whole other slew of things I got questions on for sure. So I'm going to reach out to you and maybe a month from now or whatever, but we're definitely going to try to get you back on the show. But as we sort of polish things off here, because I just I have so many other things I want to dive into, and just the science you talked about, the obsession with – slowly changing things in the output is just the food science that you're in invertedly doing is just so key. And I also want to talk about what it means to be the best pizza in the world and, and what that goal means in that competition against yourself. So I'm just going to anchor that for the next episode so I can get you back on. Uh, I hope you'll come back on, but as we finish things off, if you could say anything to the world of entrepreneurs out there and you could help influence them or impact them, Raphael, what would you tell them? If you don't wanted your cold. voice. Yeah, yeah I would say don't be cold to the world. You know, the world isn't as bad as a place as you think. You know, it's tough, but it's not bad. It's hard, but it's not cruel. And just trust your gut and trust yourself and you'll be happy. Just like I'm going to make the best pizza, but I got to trust myself. And my, I trust the words of my loved ones. It's really it, man. You got to just go for it. But you also got to realize that the world isn't as hard as it, it, the world isn't as ugly as what people make it out to be. Only the restaurant life is brutal, but it's doable. If it wasn't doable, people wouldn't do it. I agree. And too many people are scared of it, not really realizing that there's more food entrepreneurs in the world than any other field. Oh, any yeah. other field. And it's as ancient. Everyone's like, oh, prostitution's the oldest job in the world. I hear that all the time. <laughs> no, like making food, being peddler, serving people food was, is the oldest thing in the world, probably even farming or hunting or whatever. But really, like this ability to provide for ourselves and other people and families really is one of the oldest things in the world. Okay. And we break bread and we come around food because it's hugely important to humans and the growth that we have. Um, Raphael, you're an incredible human. I'm really glad that you decided to come on the show. I the no, impact I that it. the impact that you're going to have, I think is huge and this episode alone you know really hits home for me and it's not always that this happens for me uh, cuz I record like I recorded seven podcasts yesterday. I'm on four or five today. Uh, I'm on five today with you. And one of the things I've It's, you know, as the more I do them, it's really unusual, I would say, that someone has such a heavy impact on me or brings me back to something that I need to remember or a shedding that I need to do to make room for the new version of myself. It's not a complete new version, but you have to shed some old things in order to make room for the new things. It's just the way it is, unfortunately. But I enjoy it because that's really good with life. But one of the things that you've been able to do is stay grounded. And you've been able to build a family business in a loving environment with your family and your patience and your kindness and your loving nature. While you may, no one's perfect and we're all not always the way that we try to live up to, your ability to stay grounded and stay focused and stay what should I say, aligned with your purpose in a lot of ways, not always, but I can tell like you're talking about your family and how important it is for you to start your own family. And the business has benefited from you being true to yourself. I appreciate it. You know, it's talking with you and making the decision to come on was, you know, it's another thing that I talked to my family. I'm like, this guy wants to do a podcast with me about being an entrepreneur. 
And they go, you know, give it a shot, Ralph. You can't be cold to the world. And I'm like, you're right. Let's, let's do it. And actually getting to talk to you really opens up my eyes to, you know, there is more than to myself than just I'm going to make a pizza. There is a drive to be an entrepreneur. And, I, you know, I really look forward to part two with you. I, I really do. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about We're going to go back and talk about slinging water and shoveling, and we're going to start to talk a little bit about oh, yeah. some of this stuff and, and break it down. i got to find some pictures. Yeah, there we go. I, de- I definitely got some pictures. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have all that stuff, too. It's funny that you just mentioned that because I've shoveled snow and plowed driveways and anything I could do to make money, really. And it wasn't about the money. It was about the independence. And that's the funny part. That, like People who are about the money, they'll stop as soon as they get enough right or oh, they'll stop yeah. but if you have the drive it goes on forever which is also where we're going to talk about in the next podcast when you have the drive for independence you keep going because you're looking for more you want the independence and while everyone's like oh is it greed no it's not to be confused with greed we're talking about working a lot so you have freedom uh financial freedom uh, independence to build your own legacies, but also so you feel fulfilled, like you're contributing to the world in the way that you were meant to contribute. You know, and that's the yeah, biggest man. part. Um, I, I I completely agree. You're an incredible human. I'm really glad. I'm can't wait to get to know you more. I'm definitely going to be reaching out. I'm going to send out a thing so we can set up another episode for sure. Um, will you tell everyone where they can find you online and, and what your store location is? Yeah, you can uh, follow us at Emilio's underscore Woodfire Pizza. Um, it's we're 170 Chestnut Street in Nutley, New Jersey. It's a very small restaurant and we have no signs. I won't put a sign outside because it's getting so crowded that the day I put a sign, it's going to be even tighter. And right now it's getting nuts. So no sign. It's got a little sticker on the window. 170 Chestnut Street, Emilio's Woodfire Pizza. You can find us on Instagram. It's uh, it's like Emilio's Speakeasy or Underground Wood Fire Pizza Shop. Like it's like, it's kind of that's what it's like. It's, it's, it's hilarious. It's kind of working in your favor, I think, and um, it's kind of a cool idea because I agree that you're using attraction, not promotion, and I think that that's a very strong quality. Too many businesses want to promote themselves and do all this marketing and advertising and promote, promote, promote. But if you're doing the right thing, you're staying true to your core values, you're staying true to your business, that's attraction. People are going to want what you have. They're going to want to taste your food. They're going to want to hang out with your family. They're going to hang out with your uh, employees or team members, however you want to look at that. And so, you know, I've had a lot of humbling in my life. Like, seriously, whether I wanted it or not, it just comes to you. And I think that there's a lot of humbling that you've experienced in life, sort of in in sort of the knocks and in college and then trying to be an electrician and then that sort of getting taken out from underneath you that's led to this humbling. And then even your girlfriend, uh, now fiance, saying to you that your pizza sucks at the very beginning (laughs) was such a humbling experience that... Dude, that was the worst. (laughs) Yeah. I've been there. I've been there, but they... (laughs) And they almost unintentionally create the dragon you have to go slay on their behalf. And I know this is a male thing, and everyone's going to be like, whatever, but we kind of need it as men. When a woman does that, it almost creates the dragon that we need to go slay on their behalf to go champion the woman. And it's like, huh. And it really is, for an entrepreneur, it's unbelievable the inspiration and motivation that that can create in an individual. It's crazy to me. And, yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's nuts because, you know, I when I met her, I was 170 pounds and I looked good. Now I'm 225, but I slayed the dragon and I ate him. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah that's yeah. good. It comes back around as you find balance in your business and you start to grow more. <laughs> Trust me, I've been there. I, 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 like I think about when I started food service partners back in the day and, and where I ended up in the end and and now where I am now building freedom foods and these podcasts and a TV show called fruitopia. And, uh, and it's just, you, you eventually get balanced, but I, I 100% agree. You end up eating the dragon. You get comfortable, you slay them and then you eat them. And it's like, Oh Oh, yeah, but yeah, I'm working hard. You don't understand. I'm not just sitting around, but 
weirdly that stuff catches up with you but i think it's part of that initial experience of being an entrepreneur you're so dedicated of working in your business that you don't have a lot of time to work on your business or on yourself or on your personal brand which is some of this stuff which i'm not only talking about in social media everyone's like personal brand well i have a instagram page no no i'm talking about your character your integrity and stuff like that that it's funny you just said that because I, well, there's a group of chefs in Nutley that's kind of like taking over the Nutley food scene. And we all have that same thing is that we all work in our business. Now we're at the point in the, the since we opened to now start working on our business. So the way you just put that was one thing we always mentioned to each other. And these are like fine dining chefs. Like they're legit chefs, these guys. And it's one of those things that's so hard on an entrepreneur to let go of that initially. But I think with the right team, which is why I emphasize your family and what I'm really going to talk about also in the next episode is what that's like and where you're going and why that strong foundation is also a model for teamwork for future team members. So we'll get into that in the next episode. Thank you again, Raphael. Again, will you tell us one one more time where they can find you online? Go to Instagram. It's Emilio's underscore Woodfire Pizza. We're in Nutley, New Jersey. Awesome, everyone. And and thank you, everyone, for listening in. Uh, I appreciate everyone. We're having, like, crazy thunderstorms and lightning storms and, like, monsoons on the East Coast, like Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York City, oh, yeah. where I'm recording right now. So if anyone heard any thunder or, or crazy rain, uh, there's, like, it's crazy how loud it can be, even with a studio and even with all the soundboarding, that you can hear what's going on outside. It's raining so hard sometimes. So I don't uh, think anyone can hear it, can. but it's, like, pretty amazing. And, you know, it's just life. Uh, just, like, it's one of the craziest things I've ever seen, like, how much it's raining. And I'm doing 75 hard right now, and one of my workouts got to be outside. And literally for the past eight days, I've been trying to work outside, and it's pouring rain. And I'm just like mental toughness, mental tough. I can do this, but it's crazy. You get into like eight, nine days of working outside and the monsoon rain. You're like, holy crap. But yeah, it's what soldiers there's go through. There's a point where you even say to yourself like, man, I'm a little wet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, again, if you want to find uh, Emilio's Wood Fire Pizza, they're located at 170 Chestnut Street in Nutley, New Jersey for the audience. If you want to find me, you can find me on Instagram at Justin the Food Entrepreneurs. If you want to find this podcast, you can find us at Justin and the Food Entrepreneurs at on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. And you can also, if you're hungry and you're looking for food, you can always click on DoorDash on your app Uh, But I always always recommend going to the restaurants, going to experience them, and going out and experience the world because part of breaking bread is going to experience it outside your homes also and getting to meet new people and people just like Raphael here. You want to get to know these entrepreneurs. They will have impact on your life. And one of the reasons I do this podcast is because we don't even realize how much impact and influence the restaurant entrepreneurs in and food entrepreneurs in our communities have on us and our families and how much joy they bring us through the food that they create through love and compassion and dedication and kindness and discipline that we're talking about on here so thank you again for everyone for listening in and we're out take care